and welcome to Note Doctors. My name is Paul. My name is Jen. My name is Ben. And we are your hosts. We are all university music theory instructors who are passionate about music theory and music theory instruction. In this podcast, we will be talking about all things theory with some of the best music theory teachers in the country. If you want to know more about music theory and the most effective and innovative ways to teach it, this is the podcast for you. So today, our very special guest is David Newman. So Ben, tell us a little bit about Professor Newman. Sure. David Newman has had an international performing career as a classical singer and teaches voice and aural skills at James Madison University. He also writes educational songs, which have achieved some notoriety on YouTube. His first music theory album, The Well-Trained Ear, is available on Bandcamp. Yeah, and I, and I want everything to be fun. I don't want everything to be fun. I do want everything to be fun. If it can be. What I'm so surprised is that I, I meet colleagues who, who are reluctant to bring any joy or frivolity into the classroom lest people think that it's not serious. Like, why, why should we be so serious? Why should we be miserable learning this stuff? So today we are so pleased to have with us Dr. David Newman. And if you've ever been on YouTube looking for sight singing or music theory or aural skills videos to help you, you have probably seen his face on a video or two. <laughs> so we have our first kind of YouTube celebrity perhaps. Um, but before we uh, kind of get into, get into your work, um, we always like to ask our guests, you know, what got you into uh, teaching theory? You are a professional vocalist in, in addition to a theory professor. And so um, kind of tell us a little bit about how you ended up getting to where you're at. And, you know, could you have predicted that you would go from like performing, you know, Bach's St. Matthew's Passion and Haydn's Creation to like Miss Mixlydian and Mr. Dorian go drinking? <laughs> like, how does one make that, how does one pivot into that direction? <laughs> I, I, I mean, one could argue that my entire, the rest of my career was the actual pivot, but I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. And by the way, thank you for, uh, thank you for granting me the honorary doctorate. Um, oh. I don't actually have one. <laughs> but, uh, A note doctor's doctorate. <laughs> yeah. um, I, if only that qualified me for anything, that would be nice. Um, no, yeah, I, uh, so, I mean, I think, uh, uh, my, my foray into theory, my foray into theory is a totally different story than my foray into songwriting, but, um, into theory was just, you know, being a, a, um, you know, a poor artist, uh, who needed work. And, uh, I walked into the, I was teaching voice at JMU and, uh, I walked into the, uh, department head's office uh, just at the right time as he hung up the phone and looked mournfully up at me and said, can you teach oral skills? <laughs> and I said, I had learned by that time. I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Always yes. And found myself on the first day of class with no textbook and uh, no idea what I was doing, but a class full of oral skills, three students uh, asking, looking to be taught something. So. Um, I mean, I think it took me about a week to get a textbook. So I, I think for the first week I was making it all up anyway. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was helpful. Um, and, and, uh, yeah. And then that just proved to be a really wonderful year for me of, of brain growth. They, they say that you can, um, they. But they, they say that you can continue to grow neural pathways, even when you're an old fart like me. And, um, the, uh, and I found myself really challenged that year, but I am not surprised that I started writing songs that year uh, mm -hmm. in a, at a pace that I had never done before. So uh, tracing back and going back to a, the, the other half of that question was, you know, does teaching ear training or uh, writing songs about about this stuff, you know, where did, how did that come out of singing Bach? Mm. Well, I mean, I did that long before I sang Bach. Mm. Uh, and, and I really went to music school initially 
uh, at least a part, large part of my motivation was to go to college, but have a backup plan for my attempt to be the next Billy Joel. Mm. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I now see many ways in which Billy Joel is, it was, uh, you know, way better <laughs> prepared <laughs> to succeed at that than, than I was. Well, he was uh, a high school dropout. So just by going to college, <laughs> you kind of messed that up, right? <laughs> But I loved theory, but I'm, uh, I also, uh, you know, I find myself teaching fun, uh, fundamentals, uh, mm -hmm. right now. And, uh, and I have told my students that I'm extraordinarily well qualified to do that because I took theory one three times <laughs> 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 because I, uh, I took it in high school, but I didn't apparently do well enough to pass out of it in college. And then I decided that since I already knew it all, I didn't need to go to class. And so fortunately, my theory <laughs> one, my first theory one professor who failed me still is friends with me. So that's good. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so I, I did, I took it three times, so I should know it really well. Um, so you share that with your students as kind of a way to, um, you know, help them understand that maybe the challenges that they're facing doesn't mean that that's going to determine their success, you know, in music, right? Indeed. And yeah, and it's okay to make mistakes. <laughs> it's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, and it's also, you know, you might, uh, you never know, you, you might think that you don't like it now, but you might wind up teaching it someday. <laughs> <laughs> I think this particular generation of students that we have in our classrooms right now, has a huge fear of failure as though it's something permanent or a mark on you or, or something. I don't know. I just sense from them that they're terrified of that idea. And so I think it's really good to hear for them to hear us talk about, like, I've applied to many conferences and been told no many times, right. or, you know, I've auditioned for things and not gotten it. I think they have this idea sometimes that college professors just can do whatever they want or, you know, they succeed easily at everything. And of course, that's not true. Um, but I've just seen in class this particular fear of if they get a, a homework assignment back with a low grade there, it's like a mark on them that they're bad at this, right? And I'm like, No, you just didn't understand this one thing yet. Right? It, that's all it means. Yeah. So I, I love that you tell them that I think that's really good. We also have, I mean, as a singer, I recognize this, we have this kind of American idol, idol approach to life that people yeah. have adopted that that peddles this false uh, presumption that that people are either talented or they're not. Mm -hmm. And that something somehow everything springs from being talented. And um, yeah, when I can you know, they, they, their eyes, you know, get wide open when they see that I can just, you know, play a, a song that I've heard by ear. And uh, some of them seem to think that that's magic. And I'm, I'm like, no, that just happens from doing it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing that these patterns work, and this is, mm -hmm. this is what I'm hearing. Right, absolutely. So, so when you started writing your the songs that you've written for your RO skills classes, did they kind of originate from a class session? Was there something that sparked you to do that? Or did it just kind of naturally happen? I think all of them came from a desire to teach some specific skill. Ooh, maybe not. Um, I mean, the, at first, well, so another piece of background, like I have, um, I actually had a, a, for a while multiple YouTube channels, and I guess I still do, but I've been trying to consolidate them a little bit more. But I, before I was writing uh, music theory songs, I was writing just educational songs. I was doing my own schoolhouse rock kind of stuff for other subjects. So um, I actually found that um, I was <laughs> I, I was I just searched David Newman on Spotify. And so I just clicked, I thought you had the one album or it would be, you know, music related. So I just clicked your face and it started playing and like the Solfege songs. And then the next song was like talking about the center of a line on a triangle or like right. geometry. I'm like, what's happening here? <laughs> <laughs> it's the same voice, but now like, what is this? So, so yeah, you have these like a cottage industry of these little educational songs. I mean, I wish it was an industry. I mean, I've, I've made... I've made tens of dollars off of this, but, um, um, 
but yeah, I mean, there's the, 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 my biggest hit is actually me wrapping the periodic table. Um, <laughs> and, and I am more likely to have students come in who learned the periodic table from that song than students who recognize me as uh, uh, having written anything for theory. Hmm. I'll have to let my wife know about that. She teaches science. So <laughs> <laughs> seventh and, graders. And the fun one is the one that's the periodic table uh, symbols. Oh, uh, there's a, that's a, oh, oh, I thought I had this up. All right. He libi wicken off ni na mg alsa pi sklar kakaska ti vikerman fi kuna kuna and with and with that I I was able to I, I like I can write out a periodic table from memory. With wow. That. What a, what a skill. That's amazing. <laughs> That's a, that is a not something most musicians skill, but... can do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I certainly can't do that. But I, I love that because that also reflects your sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that's, I think, so important when teaching and teaching theory or all skills is being able to kind of laugh at yourself and not take it too seriously. And so how does, you know, how does humor and how does that kind of play into your own teaching? Uh, I mean... Yeah, I, 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 well, you know, Michael Morgan, uh, who was the conductor of the Oakland Symphony, I actually am not sure what he's doing now, but he was the conductor of the Oakland Symphony, um, said, at these prices, it's got to be fun. And it really, <laughs> it has to be fun. Like, why are we here if we're not going to make it fun? Hmm. And um, so I, I do, I relish oral skills as a, as a place to, uh, as, as a place to repeat the same dad jokes over and over again. Um, <laughs> Besides, I have to repeat them because I can't remember which ones I've used this semester and which ones I, I've, you know, I'm just taking from three years ago. So um, I just recycle all the same ones. And then if I come up with new ones, then they get added to the mix. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and I, and I want everything to be fun. I, I don't want everything to be fun. I do want everything to be fun. <laughs> if it can be. What I'm so surprised right. is that I, I meet colleagues who, who uh, are reluctant to bring any joy or frivolity into the classroom, lest people think that it's not serious. Mm. Like, why, why should we be so serious? <laughs> <laughs> why is that the preferred way to be? Yeah. Why should we be miserable learning this stuff? Yeah. Who, by extension, the article that's like less understandable, therefore better somehow. You know, like <laughs> I, I never understood that either, honestly. So, how do how do your students um, respond to those songs? How do you, or how do you? Maybe this question might be better. How do you use them with your teaching? Do they? You have your students sing them? Do they learn them? Do they just kind of listen to them? How how do you use them actually in the, your classroom kind of setting? Ah, oh, that's a great question. I wish I had a really good answer for it. Um, I can tell you how I do use them. I wish, I wish I knew how to use them best. Uh, I, I definitely, a way that I use them is just that I, I put them up and I say, Hey, there's this thing here. You should probably go listen to it. That would be fun. You know, you'll, you might learn something. Um, and that's, that's obviously not very active pedagogy. <laughs> Um, I did realize that one of the songs that I wrote, which is not as fun, but it, you know, it, it became for at least the first four or five weeks of the semester, a song that we sang every morning uh, at the beginning of class. So that the chord spelling song, we just do it mm -hmm. every morning for, for weeks. Um, because Part of what I want is for them to, like that song is uh, do, mi, do mi so, fa la do, so ti re ti so, do do do. And <clears throat> if you do that enough, well, then the, the spelling of those chords just rolls off your tongue and you don't have to think about it. And that's, that was the goal is just to, you know, kind of create m muscle memory. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and then uh, if I, you know, hopefully, you can connect that with what the chords are. And I like that it does a little bit of spiral um, learning in, in, in that it uh, introduces some chords that we're not even going to talk about yet. But then later when we talk about it and say, oh, you know, we're going to do five, seven, a four, and you hear, do mi so te. And like, hey, 
We've sung that before. You know exactly what that is and how it works. Um, yeah. And the same thing in the Dominant Seven song when, when we have, um, there's five, seven, and five, Ray Filado. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that was very non-tonal uh, rendition of that, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I should have tonicized myself first. Shame upon me. <laughs> always tonicize. You always got to tonicize. Well, <laughs> It's, it takes us back to that idea of making mistakes uh, really evident and, <laughs> and acceptable. Mm -hmm. I'm really good at that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, at times. Uh, none of my recordings were working today in class, and so my students had to suffer through me sight reading like Schubert piano concertos. And so uh, <laughs> that always makes them feel better about their lives as pianists, I'm sure. Oh, God. <laughs> So, um, what do you think? So you just did a little bit of chord singing and you talked about muscle memory. Um, do you do other types of chord singing, you know, outside of the songs or is that their main kind of link to chord singing? What do you think the benefits are there? Oh gosh. Uh, for, I'm not sure I'm answering your question correctly, but let me, let me, uh, go with this anyway. The, one thing that I've been frustrated to realize, because I've always been, I've spent most of my career in music theory teaching second year oral skills. Mm. And so I, I have developed opinions about what should happen in first year oral skills. And this year I'm teaching oral skills too, so I'm getting a chance to apply some of it. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I, I fear that, I fear students become becoming reliant on stepwise motion and, mm. and a little bit, I recognize, so I do something I have given a lot of thought to is, is sort of perceptually how students approach things and how I have perceptually approached things. So as a college student, I did not like solfege. I was not happy having this additional burden placed on <laughs> my, placed on me to, to have to figure that out as well as what the notes are why it never occurred to me until I taught it that, oh, you know, this is actually to help you. <laughs> like, if you actually start with the solfege syllable, you'll know what pitch it is. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I find that this, doing a lot of stepwise motion early on allows students to avoid having to learn where those pitches, where those scale degrees are, and then they just learn to go up what seems about the right amount within the key. Mm. And so then uh, like a very frequent mistake that I will see is someone will leap up uh, or they might be taking dictation of something that leaps up a fourth and they'll leap up a third or they'll leap up a fifth. And, um, and then everything else is off. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you wonder, okay, how much do I um, go okay? You know, I see that you at least understood how this went intervallically from there, although although it's it's wrong. Or, you know, do you cut a hard line? I, I know Gary Karpinski advocates just saying, nope, it's wrong. Uh, I, I hope I'm not misrepresenting his view. I, I think that I think that's fair. Um, and uh, but I would love to just bypass that early on chord singing just makes sure that people can arpeggiate things at least mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh and of course a lot of our books are are graded through which chords there are pet leaping within yeah yes mm -hmm. so yeah. but definitely getting people to arpeggiate things early uh i think is valuable I, I don't yeah. know if that was answering your question or not. But. Absolutely. Yeah, we I do a lot of chord singing with my students. And I think um, I've I've talked to people who teach oral skills who just don't do it at all or it never even occurred to them to sing chords or to sing along with harmonic dictations or things like that. And I'm like, no, it, it helps them hear, you know, internalize what they're hearing and uh, and figure out what it is. And I, I'm teaching oral skills three right now. I have been thinking a lot about how they often know more than they are connecting to. So um, right. I said the other day, we, we've, we've just gotten into modulation. So they're, they're doing these modulating melodies and I have a uh, song for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I had played this melody and I looked up at them and half of them 
were sitting there just like pencils, totally still staring at me like I had done something from outer space. And it's just a lot of dictation. We've done it a million times, you know? And so I said, uh, what is wrong? And they were like, I don't know what just happened at all. And I think the melody modulated from like C sharp minor to A major inside four measures. Huh. So, you know, that's a little intense okay. maybe. Yeah. But um, I said, so I played a measure or so, and I said, okay, skips or leaps, you know, skips or steps. Is it a triad or a scale? And you know, right away, oh, that was a scale. Okay, up or down, down. What did it start on? So, and they all knew, like they're all answering just like that. And I was like, <laughs> what what is it that you think you don't know <laughs> you know right so i think and one of them said well i because it's going to a new key i i wasn't really sure i knew what it ended on but it didn't occur to me to think like oh it just stepped down to that note and i could just write that down you know because i wasn't sure what the solfege was in the old key i was like well <laughs> but you still knew the answer so it doesn't matter right. necessarily how you get there it matters that you're hearing it and understanding it you know so yeah. helping them draw those connections anytime we can do that. And I think chord singing helps with that. Yeah, yeah cool. Thanks. Yeah. I think so too. I used to have a friend that I played a lot of gigs with um, in the summers, just jazz commercial playing. I did some over the summers when I was an undergrad. And this particular guy was an outstanding improviser. And one time he went on this rant about how you should learn arpeggios before you learn scales. And I always thought that was kind of a interesting hot take, you know, but it kind of speaks to that importance of arpeggios. And even like just in jazz context, for example, being able to follow changes, you know, if you know arpeggios, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that takes you pretty far, I think. And uh, there's something to be said for that. So I, I see where you're coming from. I had a jazz improv teacher for a very brief period of time who said that you should be able to play any scale in random order. That they didn't like the idea of playing the scale, like just note after note, but that you should be able to look at the scale and then play them in random order, because that's essentially what you do when you improvise. You're pulling from mm -hmm. content, but you're not doing it in like, you don't just play like da 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 when you're improvising, right? And I was Worst like, you know, that's ever. really clever. <laughs> it really is clever. Like he could, you know, jazz has all the really crazy scales, but... He could do like mixolydian flat six and play from like all these different, you know, just put it in any random order, create something yeah. interesting. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So you create these these songs, um, and one of the skills that you are able to tap into is because you are a multi instrumentalist, or at least you are very uh, uh, skilled. And singing, playing piano. You already mentioned before our interview. You can play the bass guitar, <laughs> <laughs> um, and this you have this kind of you know jack of all trades kind of um, uh, skill set. And how has that been beneficial to you? And um, how is that maybe different than some some of the ways you know uh, university music training is focuses on the specialization and you getting you into this really narrow narrow um, uh, path. And you have you have this kind of very broad perspective and how has that helped you in your career and in your teaching? I'm, I, I mean, I ha haven't always thought of it as much of a help, but, uh, <clears throat> or I've at least I've always wished that I was better at all of these instruments, but, um, but, you know, from the keyboard, I have a strong sense of, of the keyboard, uh, and, and what chord shapes feel like. And, and honestly, at this point now it's, it's helpful. I, I don't understand this. Maybe you can explain it to me. My, my hands know music theory better than my brain does mm -hmm. sometimes. Like mm -hmm. I, I hear mm -hmm. a modulation and I think, oh, I have no idea what just happened. And then I think, how would I play it? Oh, that's mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess I do have at least that skill there, but I, I think that the piano shows you certain things very clearly. But mm -hmm. the bass shows you fourths and fifths very clearly and mm -hmm. octaves. Yeah. And it, it doesn't, it almost doesn't matter what key you're in. The shapes are exactly the same. Same mm -hmm. with guitar. Yeah. You know, and uh, so unless you're worried about open strings, you're, the shapes are just the same. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that gives you a, a sort of different window into things. Certainly mm -hmm. helps when you do modus novus. <laughs> <laughs> to know fourths and seconds really well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Now, do you, um, I've been thinking about this a lot because I'm a pianist. And so do you, so I, when I think of a chord or, or I, you know, hear something, I, I picture the piano or I, I picture how I, how I, um, would play that. And I've been thinking more and more about that because it's something that is oftentimes subconscious. You don't even think about that. I'm thinking about the piano as I'm hearing this note. Um, are you thinking about, you know, a fretboard? Are you thinking about a keyboard? And do you find that that helps to, you know, encourage students to think like that as well? Wow. You know, I haven't been sure about that. I have, I want to tell you about this series that I have that's nothing to do with any of what we're talking about, but I, or maybe it is, I don't know. It's definitely pedagogical. I, I started a series on my YouTube channel uh, uh, called Sing Along Solfege. And the, basically it came out of the premise of how can I teach Solfege to my mom through YouTube without being there? Mm. <laughs> and the question I got hung up on the most was how do I teach what dough is? How do I explain the tonic but i realized that maybe the the solution for the solution i chose was uh rather than try and explain it from the get-go i could just say uh here is here's some things and we're gonna sing on solfege you don't need to know solfege you don't need to know what it means we're just gonna sing some things and then you know around the third video I have to say too that this it's a terribly boring series i need to re redo it in some way that's less boring <laughs> like have you all like like have a video chat with you all and, and we'll all talk about the songs that would be more fun um but uh but but the, you get to the third video and then I, then after having done a number and they say hey you notice we're always ending on do that's that's because that's the note that feels like we've arrived we've gotten yeah. home and mm -hmm. and then i hadn't really anticipated going where i went with it but uh by the 13th episode i had described t tonic subdominant and dominant triads i had i even found mm. a melody and i was surprised to discover this i didn't do it intentionally i just did home on the range and when i got to the end i thought we're seldom is heard a discouraging road and the skies are not cloudy all day i just realized that is showing you a cadential six four mm -hmm. to a five mm -hmm. and a one that you have me re do but you can tell as you sing it that me and do don't feel finished mm. they mm -hmm. still feel a pull down to T, and now you want to resolve back to Do. Hmm. And so the, all of that was, I, I might have completely tangented away, but uh, great. all of that was with without keyboard, without notation even, just mm -hmm. through solfege. And so I think that's the other advantage to chord singing, going back, mm -hmm. is that if you have someone who doesn't play an instrument, uh, or doesn't play a, a harmonic instrument, a chordal instrument, that they have a way then to uh, um, imagine chords for the harmony for themselves without in a physical, in, in a way that they're producing it and not just listening mm -hmm. to it. And that, um, and that maybe for people who do play a, a instrument that can play chords, that that they would have another way of recognizing i i have had for example pianists come into my uh a sight singing keyboard uh, you know a, a, a keyboard playing assignment um and just try and sight read through it and play wrong notes and i'd say well what did you play wrong and i've had a pianist turn to me and say i don't know mm -hmm. and i wow. do well okay <laughs> You, you forgot to look at the key signature. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. you, you might try playing F sharps next time. <laughs> but that's so interesting because there is this disconnect between what they're seeing on the page and what they're hearing. Mm -hmm. Like you, you, should, you should be able to hear what that sounds like and then play it, right? Yes. Rather than the opposite. You, you read it and then you play it and then you hear it, right? But I think, I think there are instruments and piano can be one of them where you can learn to push the right buttons at the right time and be rather mm -hmm. successful without mm -hmm. actually going through that process. Yeah. Mm. yeah, the piano, my piano colleague um, at Dallas Baptist frequently talks about how she 
she'll have a really very fine pianist and she'll suddenly realize they don't really read. They're not really reading that they've acquired a lot some other way. Yeah. <laughs> and she'll, you know, so she has kind of worked that into her teaching that she, she forces them to read what's on the page and does a lot more sight reading and things like that with them to build that skill. Cause you can, there are ways either your ear can get you there, which is kind of the opposite of what you described or like just a, reading pretty well but not really ever connecting it to sound that can get you there too but you really need to be doing both to be a, a good musician and to to make that next step yeah my girls were walking through as because they got <laughs> home from school and it made me think of as you're talking about it how in their their elementary school you know they're uh, in the music class they're they they learn so me right so mm -hmm. me and then mm -hmm. and la and they're, they're you know building this kind of um pentatonic scale mm -hmm. they don't know what so is they don't know what me is they don't know what that oh, when yeah, they get no. to do that it's that's just what do really means right mm -hmm. but they're learning those intervals they're learning how those sound how they kind of want to move and they don't have to know what how important do is or how important so is but to get mm -hmm. that in that their mind so that they can then you know learn it so rather than this right up front all this kind of heavy taxing material like you got to know what dough is and all these really important things <laughs> like oh i have to know all this stuff just sing it get it in your head and then learn after mm -hmm. the fact right yeah totally it's sort well, of the oh sorry. go ahead ben <laughs> the thought that popped into my head when you said that about teaching your mom what dough is is that i love that yeah you know guido probably didn't often end on dough. Like, you know, when you think back a thousand years of solfege, you know, how many things have been around for a thousand years, you know? Mm. <laughs> and even for Guido, I don't think dough was necessarily dough in, in a certain way. You know what I mean? I don't know. That was kind of my mm. first thought, but that's kind of a history of theory take, I guess. But No, no, I think that's, and that's, and, and the tonic sol fa system, you know, is very Guidonian in right. that, in that, sense although you know not built on hexachords but <laughs> <laughs> um uh, but i i mean the the guidonian hand I, the i i think well what what were they using as a anyway right yeah <laughs> right. Uh, right. right uh there, i mean there was no standard until 1930. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah it's true and even that has changed so for 900 years <laughs> or something, we've only been in 10%. We've only been in this small sliver of the history of yeah. solfege. Well, and it's still different depending on where you are in the world, you know, like things are so much brighter yeah. if you're in Europe and you go hear the orchestra, it's so much brighter because they tune sharper and yeah. Right. They make per percussion instruments at 442 now mm -hmm. or <laughs> maybe even higher. And um, I mean, the way we, that's something that's, I guess I've, learned more about because I do so much historically informed performance is is just like how do we know what pitch uh, Bach was at well we look at his organ and see what pitch it was at <laughs> yeah or uh, the the winds or the wind instruments from that area and and uh, do you all know this uh, you probably do but uh, the the Bach uh, Magnificat like there's a D there's a version in D and there's a version in E and it's because he moved and he didn't want to rewrite the wind parts. <laughs> wow. Wow. That I love that because it's such a practical reason. <laughs> Not artistic. It's like, oh, we only have instruments in E. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing I was going to ask about, I don't know if, Paul, you mentioned this earlier or not. I'm trying to remember. But, you know, I think a lot of your songs, which I absolutely love, by the way, again, I don't think that's overstating it to say it again, that they're so catchy, they're so useful. I mean, everyone should please at least check out one of these songs um, after the episode. One of the things that is required to produce these, you know, is kind of some basic editing skills or, you know, click on a camera, mm -hmm. click on a microphone. You make sure the audio sounds good. And now, you know, you have this album on Spotify and things. You know, can you talk to us about how those skills have kind of helped you and then if those skills should be taught you know to our our undergraduates as they come up because it's certainly something that we all use now during the pandemic on a on a daily basis mm-hmm wow 
there are so many ways to go with this. But yes, I mean, we I think we have to all know these skills now uh, because for one thing, you're going to be left in the dust if you don't. Um, but uh, I do like that I have, you know, this is my teaching set up. Uh, I've got my green screen. Um, <laughs> that that means that uh even though this looks like my living room it's my, it's my it's a picture of my living room because i'm actually teaching from my basement with a with a green screen nice. but um i've got my nice microphone sitting right over here and um so i hope that i have good video and good sound for mm -hmm. my students um yeah. i've got my ethernet connection i've i've uh, got my computer set up with sound jack so that in voice lessons I can uh, play for my students in real time mm. um, or close to real time mm -hmm. and uh, um, all of these things like learning to use being able to use sound jack or some similar program I think is just going to become necessary for, for performers because now if you can rehearse before before actually getting to a show, why should I house you for five days in a different mm -hmm. environment when mm -hmm. you could stay at home and just attend a few rehearsals together? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, you know, we, it gives us more, it has revealed that we have more options than we knew we had. Mm -hmm. to, to jump off of that question in a totally different way, <laughs> <laughs> um, something that was really vital for me and it really helped though that right when I started teaching ear training I also got an iPhone I got my first iPhone mm -hmm. and that made video creation so much easier all you did, needed to do was set up the iPhone hit record you know maybe do some minimal, minimal editing upload it to YouTube there it was mm -hmm. and we have to create I've been thinking about this a lot lately we have to create simple systems for us to create content mm -hmm. and we can't hold ourselves to too high of a standard <laughs> because who has time right. we have to be efficient with our time and with our with our resources and time is a is definitely a resource and so i'm i am making new videos for my class but i have to if i make if i invest too much time in one video i'm not going to make i'm not going to be able to make enough content for them mm -hmm. to help them um but I am, you know, I, I'm, I'm now I'm taking students through sight singing exercises and saying, okay, here's the sight singing exercise. You try it, then we'll talk about it. And then mm. that, that gives them a, a way to practice it, but also a way to check and see if they've done well. For sure. I know, you know, for me at the beginning of the pandemic, I'd always try to almost edit my videos down to, you know, absolute perfection or something and now it's riddled with various jokes like you said dad jokes yeah. you know a blip note on the piano or the trumpet in my case and you know examples that start off with a little bit of an ad at the beginning before the musical example <laughs> you know before it would never be it would be edited out but now oh okay i'm not going to go back and edit out that little bit of an ad so yeah um it's a lot more efficient and i think it's almost more real. I've had a lot of students tell me that it feels more real um, to have that kind of conversational tone, to make things um, um, as conversational and, you know, failure ridden um, as they normally would be. And everyone can do it. Like you don't, I mean, I would be happy for everyone to go and use my videos, but you can make your own videos. And uh, Paul, Paul, I used your do t videos in my class this semester just so you know awesome <laughs> um, oh my goodness that that silly song <laughs> well and being silly is makes it great they yeah. loved it they mm -hmm. loved it your minor one is great paul <laughs> I, have, I have a minor one too yeah he's but, so humble but it's awesome no but I, I don't i don't have the wonderful baritone voice that you have so. <laughs> yeah, we, i don't have the doctorate that you have so there you go <laughs> even <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I, I need you all to know and and whoever's listening that that um, that uh, we're still recording the final version of this, but we do have a modulation song coming and Christine Boone is going to sing the the, oh. the it's a duet. Awesome. But it starts off with I, I don't remember what key it's actually in. So I'm just going to do it in this key. Um, 
that's a shame that I can't remember that since I am actively working on recording it. But um, <laughs> but it's uh, I was sad, so I cho chose a minor key, and I felt bad till I made a move to modulate to three. Then things felt better, <laughs> if only relatively. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> this is why so, yeah, everyone has to check out these songs. They're just great. Oh, my goodness. Totally. I it, need that song for with... Earl Skills 3, clearly. Right, 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 right. Well, it's on its way. It's on its way. If, if you tell you can try and hurry. No, don't try and hurry Christine with her <laughs> recording. But um, and uh, yeah. And it ends with like multiple modulations through uh, through chromatic medians. It's fantastic. Oh, wow. it, it visits about twelve keys in the process. <laughs> so you got It's just a couple more than uh, Beyonce's "Love on Top," I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Or oh. the recent CPAC uh, national anthem. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the guy uh there's a video of a guy playing like a harmonization along with her and it's fantastic i love um, it if you're listening i had one of my students that. tell me in office this week that uh, he listens to my videos on 2x my lecture videos on 2x unless i'm talking about beyonce <laughs> <laughs> You can't rush Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> I just started laughing. I didn't know what to say. I said I'm not insulted. Go with it. That's great. So what? Um, so you've talked a little bit about kind of your teaching currently. So um, just, I think we like to ask this question so that we can commiserate with all of our <laughs> fellow colleagues around the country. But you know, how has how has this you know now I guess going on a year been for you um, at James Madison and are you teaching online, face to face, kind of hybrid, and how have you been able to kind of manage that? I I am I feel really fortunate that I've been able to be completely online. Yeah. Um. I and I can't imagine. I I feel terrible for anyone who's had to teach hybrid because I just can't imagine how you could make that work well for either set of students. Mm -hmm. Like no matter what, that's going to be worse. Um. I would love to be in person. I miss a lot of things about being in person. I miss singing together. Uh, I especially miss, uh, you know, being able to sing through uh, chord matrices together, mm -hmm. you know, where they can hear a harmony happening and that they're making it. And, um, but, uh, but on the flip side, uh, teaching online means that I can see everyone and they can see everyone else, at least if they have their cameras on. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I definitely have a better, more solid relationship with my students who have their cameras on yeah. than the ones who are just a name on a screen. And then mm -hmm. I think, oh, you're in my class? Oh, <laughs> how interesting. Um, but, uh, and then it, the, the, I mean, the bad thing is that it forces you to think about how to be efficient uh, with, with your resources and their resources uh, but the good thing is it forces you how to, to think about how to be efficient with your resources <laughs> and their resources. And so, we, you know, we've adopted uh, this sort of proprietary program um, that that uh, does dictations. Mm -hmm. And so we provide it, the, the, the material and then they, they uh, type it into the program and, and it says, you missed this note or this chord identification is wrong. And then I can give them the opportunity, I don't have to, but I do give them the opportunity to go back and fix it because I would rather have them learn to get it right than, yeah. than get it wrong and go, oh no, I'm terrible. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and then, you know, thinking about how to leverage resources, like I can take the whole class through a sight singing assignment and force everyone to sit through that whole thing, but I've definitely got, you know, a few dozen students who could read through it fine the first time. They don't need to sit through all of that. And I've got a num number of other students who probably need, you know, to go through it three or four times before they understand what's going on. And uh, if I can create materials that let them go through it at their own pace, yeah. then everyone's time is being valued. Yeah. I do like that. Yeah. And I, 
I, one of the things that I've been doing, because I, I think that in the pandemic, um, it, it's really important to have contact with people, to, to, to have regular contact with people, to not lose people, um, to keep all the sheep in the fold. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so one of the things I've been doing is I've been meeting at every class period, but often for, um, well, I always try to keep it less, less than the full length of class. And then the rest of the class is, is uh, work done at your own pace. Mm. Um, so that I'm, I'm not hogging their time too much. Uh, and it's, that's something that would be harder to do in person mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. if, if, if your professor lets you out 10 minutes early, if you're in person, you might think, oh, great, but all you're going to do is go and chat with your friends. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, it's not really like a good time to go and finish the work of, of class on your own pace. Yeah. But, but this does let you do that. So. Yeah, I like that. I was talking with my other um, theory faculty today, and we were talking about students who we have to kind of uh, check on, the kind of because there are, it's really easy for these in this environment for students to kind of disappear, mm -hmm. and so finding ways of connecting with them or just checking in on them, and uh, I think has been so so important and something that we have to remember to do regularly because it's it's really hard. Students are having a hard time with this. They are, and even, I mean, I am teaching face-to-face. -face. I'm kind of in a hybrid situation. I'm face-to-face, -face, and then most of my classes have someone who is not in the room as well, um, who's tuning in. And uh, this week, you know, it kind of marks the one-year anniversary of when things started to go sideways last year. So <laughs> right. Um, right about now this week is when our trip to Paris with the University Corral was canceled, and... Then spring break, you know, was lengthened and then so all of those announcements were coming right about now and the students got sort of talking about it. We had a bit of a rabbit trail in one of my classes um, of the students just sort of grieving a lot of the things that that they didn't get this last year. One of the students was saying, you know, I, I was done with ensemble credits last spring. I never got that last concert that I thought I would get where my parents were going to come and my fiance was going to be there. Just all that, those lists of things. And so even though they're face to face and even though they're getting that interaction, it's still hard. It's still behind a mask. It's still complicated and challenging. So I think it can be, yeah, it, it's good to keep an eye on them. But even face to face, they still, they're still struggling. It's been a weird year for sure. Yeah, music is such a communal activity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. don't get any of those communal activities. In fact, tonight, um, the TW Concert Choir is doing a concert in the parking garage. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the third floor of the parking garage. And so um, this is the, I'm, I'm going it tonight and I have a certain time that I can show up. And so it's, everything is regimented so that we keep social distance and all the chairs mm -hmm. separate. And this is the first concert I will have attended since last March. And I'm really looking forward to it, but it's very surreal to, to think that, wow, it's already been a year. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't want to end on just kind of a sad note because <laughs> we've just had too much of a good time talking with you, David. Um, and so we wanted to kind of end with just some rapid fire questions. All right. So these are just kind of um, off the cuff questions that we have. Um, and just you can feel free to give off the cuff responses. And um, I, I actually have one so I could go first because um, this is what I really want to know. My question is, what's your favorite solfege pun? My so favorite soulfish <laughs> pun. Oh my gosh, it's I'm not sure it's nice to say. Uh, but every time I do a five Is it or a, No, 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 no. It's just that every time I every time I do a five seven or a five, I ask them to identify whether there's a seventh and I say, Did I give a fa? I did not give a fa. <laughs> So, you know, the important thing is to know in the end whether I gave a fa. <laughs> so, the students don't seem to mind Very that I clever. repeat that one frequently. I'm sure they love it. That's hilarious. Oh, that's great. I love that. Yeah. We're using that <clears throat> next week. Did I say that was a pun? That was just, I was just being, uh, I was just trying to be clear. Right, yeah. right. There's no, no other meaning be no. that, you, that, you, that you have there. Absolutely not. <laughs> it wouldn't be a dad joke if it was <laughs> right. <laughs> <clears throat> um, 
All right, Jenner, of course, ben? I used to say, people used to ask, before we did Takadimi, which we did before we did Count Singing, we didn't use any method at all. And I did, this was my other fa favorite, this isn't a soulfish pun, but my favorite dad joke thing, I would say it, and it was my favorite because it went over everyone's head because we're in Virginia. But I said, we don't use a method for rhythm because everyone knows the rhythm method doesn't work. <laughs> and, uh, but having uh, teaching students who almost uh, invariably grew up in uh, abstinence only um, <laughs> uh, Virginia did, didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> I love that. Wow. <laughs> so subversive. Oh, wow. <laughs> I think we're still good. I think we're still avoiding the uh, the E label on the Apple yeah. podcast. Yeah, we're yeah. That's right. <laughs> we don't swear. We're, we're good. <laughs> well, ben, do David, you have one or do you want I was going to gonna ask you, what is your favorite um, composer or artist um, to teach just from your experience? Oh, gosh. Ooh, to teach. Um, sure. Can I name three? I'm going to name three for different reasons, sure. right? Uh, I love Bach. I love, love Bach. I love the way Bach uses harmony. I love the way Bach uses rhetoric. I, I love taking a chorale and saying, you may have learned this as a piece of music that doesn't have words but guess what it's a chorale it has words and guess what every time Bach does something that you think is weird there's a reason mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. always a reason look at the words and I love have you ever read the um do you know the the there's a two volume uh biography of uh Bach by Sch Sch Albert Schweitzer mm -hmm. and the introduction is by Camille Sanson and Sanson says, mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, um, you know, I, I met this guy who came to study organ, uh, take some organ lessons with me. And, and we started going through a Bach chorale and I, uh, or Bach prelude. And I uh, admitted that there were some things that were happening that baffled me. They were all genius, but, but they just seemed very strange. And, and this young man who was Albert Schweitzer said, said, oh, don't you know the words? And I said, <laughs> and Camille Sanson says, I, there are words. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and Schweitzer uh, being the good, you know, uh, Lutheran that he was, you know, knew, knew the words to the chorale and showed them. And then of course, everything made sense. And, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, when you have voice crossings in Bach, like they're not usually hmm. accidental. <laughs> <Nah>. <laughs> they're very deliberate. Um, yeah that's great so that's one um oh sorry yeah two more um i just adore sarah borellis from the bottom oh. of my heart mm -hmm. and i Me would too. there are some things now i i've learned that some of these things actually did get covered in a theory paper recently so i was kind of i wasn't surprised but i i, I guess i i came at it independently but i um uh you know, I was I loved the song Poetry by Dead Men. And what's really cool mm -hmm. is that it never goes to a root position tonic chord mm -hmm. um, like for the whole song, except maybe once in the bridge. But then it's definitely not in a final way. So it leaves you hanging, but it taunts you with the the tonic in the right hand just through the whole song mm -hmm. saying, hey, here's what would feel good and complete, but I'm not going to let you have it. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. And the whole song is about, you know, uh, unconsummated love and uh, or, you know, just a, 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 at least a vision of of a relationship that doesn't come to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's just so like, I don't know that she was sitting around going, how can I make a really good theoretical song? But I think <laughs> that, you know, sh her instincts are so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Her, she's just such a she's such a good singer. She's such a good musician. I just mm -hmm. adore everything about her. And then the other uh, thing that I uh, oh gosh, I I can't just I don't know I can't stop. I will just keep telling you things that I love. <laughs> um, uh, I love Janelle Monet. I love doing Janelle Monet. Uh, the the um, the uh, Da, 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 to say, okay, now transcribe that for me. Have you ever tried? Do you realize she puts four notes in the space of three? 
<laughs> How Jacob so Collier of her. Yeah. She has one too many notes in there, and she, so it's just microtonal mm -hmm. coming down. Yeah. So, yeah, Janelle Monet, queen of microtonal singing. Nice. Yeah. Um, check it out. That's, that's a fun trick to play on your uh, dictation um, <laughs> class. And, uh, and then I, I did play, I did use Childish Gambino, uh, This Is America, for mm -hmm. example of two against three, oh, and duple nice. and triple. Uh, simple and compound rhythms, yeah. um, meters. So yeah, I'm gonna stop there. I'm shutting. I up. think that's a great top <laughs> three. Yeah, that is. Or four that's maybe. Four. Four. <laughs> I yeah, got top sorry. four. That's good. It's good. All right. Well, I haven't used this one in a long time, but it feels very appropriate for this podcast. So minor do or minor la. Minor do. Yeah. Do based minor. 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 Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, everything is. What are we trying to teach? Right. And right. but I, I actually I mean, I yeah, I guess I get dogmatic about this because um, like I, I really get frustrated when students are trying to use solfege for intervals and not scale degrees like scale degrees is just such a better way mm -hmm. to frame it in mm -hmm. your mind. Mm -hmm. And should you know intervals? Absolutely. But for basic stuff, boy, you should know scale degrees. Yeah. And so I have definitely been pushing functional ear trainer the mm -hmm. app on my students and just saying, look, if you know, here, uh, you know, here are small patterns. And if you can't immediately identify these notes, then you need to go and spend time on that app until you can. Yeah, that's great. That is that's good. Great. So as we wrap up, um, maybe can we close with just letting us know kind of what what you're working on, you already mentioned that you have a, a, a song in kind of the, the final works as for, uh, for about modulation, but any other projects or any things that you're working on? And then um, how can people reach out to you or find you on YouTube if they want to learn more about what you're up to? <sighs> I have, um, I'm easily findable. I'm so easily findable. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm on YouTube and, and uh, of course there, there are, there are venues that I'm findable on, but that I don't actually check. I mean, I go on Twitter once a month and go, oh yes, this exists. And then I forget about it again. Um, and, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I've deliberately made myself easy to find <laughs> and, uh, you can certainly, um, uh, on the other hand, there are so many David Newman's in the world that, um, I did get an invitation once. Oh gosh, I'm tangenting, but you know, the, the, uh, I, I got an invitation once to speak at a Mensa con, uh, convention in Michigan. And I, I was very confused, but I did a little Google search and found out that, that there, there was a conservative talk show host named David Newman in Michigan. So I, I wrote back a letter to this Mensa president <laughs> <laughs> saying, um, uh, saying, you know, there are, uh, I'm, I really appreciate the offer, but I live a long way away and the travel might be a little more than the honorarium that you're uh, planning and you might consider someone closer by like this David Newman or this David Newman or this, this David Newman who's right in, in your area. Um, uh, there, are, there, are, there are many of me. Uh, I, I do not sing Kirtan chant music. Uh, I am sadly not the, the uh, cousin of of um I, i'm not i'm sadly not the film scoring cousin of, <laughs> of randy of, newman um, randy newman uh, david newman had, uh, david newman his cousin uh, is part of a big family of of composers yeah um and we have some mutual friends uh, one of whom was very confused when i called him <laughs> and thought i was the other one but um uh anyway yeah i i'm pretty findable uh uh YouTube is, of course, very easy, and, and uh, davidnewman.info, and, uh, you know, I'm on the JME website. So that's our show. Thank you so much for listening to Note Doctors, the music theory and pedagogy podcast. We'll be back with more interviews with professors and teachers who will be dropping all sorts of theory knowledge for your education, edification, and enjoyment. So until then, bye-bye.